the AI for Good Global Summit convened by ITU, recognizes the joint responsibility of governments, the private sector, United Nations agencies, academia and others to ensure AI reaches its full potential while preventing and mitigating harms. And it's a moment that calls for action. And today I'm calling on each of you, each of you to use this summit to help the world to better understand what kinds of regulations, what kinds of guardrails we need to put in place right now. So together, let's make it innovative, let's make it safe, and let's make it responsible for all. Thank you very much. Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from me as well. I am Guillem Martinez Rora from the International Telecommunication Union, and I would like to welcome you all for joining the AI for Good Innovation Factory session, Meet the Top North America Entrepreneur Finalists, organized by the ITU. The Innovation Factory is a program launched in 2020 under the flagship initiative AI for Good. It originally started as an online pitching platform for startups, and this year it has been upgraded as more like an accelerated, accelerating program. We help startups grow and scale their innovative AI solutions to achieve the sustainable development goals by providing various business opportunities, mentoring services, matchmaking with potential investors and partners, and more. The winner of today's session will be invited to the AI for Good Innovation Factory Grand Finale at the AI for Good Global Summit in Geneva on the 30th of May, 2024. Especially today's session is organized in partnership with the Tortura Brida Institute for Partnership Excellence. Thanks to this partnership, we were able to meet very interesting AI, star AI startups helping to advance the SDGs. Thanks a lot for this invaluable contribution. And now I would like to give the floor to our moderator today. He is our regular judge, Carlo Tortura Braida di Belvedere, and he is the CEO of Gorilla Corporation and CEO and co-founder of the Tortura Braida Institute for Partnership Excellence. Carlo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, <clears throat> Guillaume, uh, for this uh, kind introduction. It is my immense uh, honor and, uh, and privilege to participate uh, yet again at another AI for Good Innovation Factory uh, session. Um, these sessions are incredibly inspiring to me. Uh, they are an indication of what the future could look like if all goes well. And uh, I think it's only with uh, everybody's uh, effort and concerted and orchestrated uh, uh, approach to AI, to aligning to the um, ethical uh, framework that is provided to us so graciously by the United Nations through the uh, Sustainable Development uh, Goals. Um, it's an opportunity for us to align. And it's an opportunity for us to see um, the passion of these entrepreneurs that are coming to us with these fantastic new ideas, with these great new technologies. Um, it is an opportunity for contagion in the most positive uh, way of seeing things. 
And yes, indeed, I have been working as um, as a judge for this AI for Good uh, Innovation Factory since 2020. Every session I've had has been incredibly different. Everyone has been truly inspiring. And this one I'm especially excited about because I have seen um, the uh, decks from the entrepreneurs and they are really extraordinary. They're on another level of uh, of quality and uh, and I think that we will all find these uh, solutions to be incredibly inspiring. So with that said, um, I would like to move forward on the agenda. And uh, perhaps uh, uh, let me see where we are with our judges and whether everybody has been able to come in. I see Sydney's there and Luca is there. Um, so that is absolutely marvelous. And, and Wen Wen Lam as well. So these are our three distinguished uh, judges uh, have uh, um, an incredible level of insight and background in artificial intelligence, in sustainability, in the corporate world, in the world of venture capital. Uh, and what I'd like to do is to uh, call up um, each of the judges in sequence and uh, ask them to say a, a few words about themselves, a very, very quick um, uh, one minute bio. And... Um, uh, and perhaps uh, uh, an idea of uh, what they're looking forward to in this session and what they, you know, what kind of special uh, secret sauce they'd like to see from the entrepreneurs that will be presenting. So uh, let me start off uh, by asking uh, Wenwen Lam to come to the floor and um, introduce herself. Hi there. Um, I am Wenwen Lam. I'm a partner at Gradient Ventures, which is Google's early stage AI fund. Um, we fund um, you know, AI native companies. Um, we are not a strategic fund, but we actually do look broadly across all categories, including infrastructure, um, future of work. And I personally focus on quite a bit of consumer AI. And um, so I'm particularly looking forward to seeing um, new things in AI that like speak to actually like um, speak to, to businesses that already exist today. So like how like an existing business could use AI. And then I also personally really like how it's impacting the social. So really interested in seeing anything in those spaces. Um, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Really exciting to have, uh, to have you here on this uh, panel of judges. Um, super welcome uh, because it is your first time with us. And uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, seeing how this goes. The uh, next person I believe that I have here on uh, the panel of uh, judges is our dis distinguished judge, uh, Sydney Tetro. Sydney, would you mind uh, joining us? Absolutely. Um, I'm super excited to be here. Um, my name is Sydney Tetro. I am a technologist at heart. I spent my entire career at the intersection of technology and innovation and building companies in that perspective. Um, I've both founded um, and run a number of companies, which I've then sold. I also spent about six years at Disney in technology commercialization. Um, and I do a lot of work around transformation AI and data with the uh, Fortune 100 today, um, including sitting on some investment committees um, for some funds. And when I think about AI and the opportunity for AI for good and all of the things that are happening with the sustainable development goals and what we're sitting here today, the things that interest me are really how AI is more rapidly allowing us to solve big problems. And I think the speed of which we now have to use what's happening with AI combined with all the things we've done in technology transformation over the last couple of decades is at this perfect intersection where big problems can be solved faster and more innovatively and in really creative pathways. And so those are types of things that I look for. And, and mostly because I've spent my entire career thinking about the art of the possible, those blue sky ideas and the things that could really transform the world. Thank you for that very inspiring introduction, uh, Sydney. Oh, so glad and so honored to have you here. And uh, last and certainly not least, uh, we have Luca Ferraro from Cisco. And uh, Luca is responsible for sustainability, he handles sustainability. He is a very dear friend of mine, and I'm very glad to have you here on this uh, very distinguished panel of judges. Luca, would you like to briefly introduce yourself and maybe tell us uh, what you would look forward to in this session, what we'd like to see from the entrepreneurs? Yes, thank you, uh, Carlo, and uh, uh, an honor to be here uh, from my side, uh, a first timer as well on this uh, panel of judges. Um, 
I've always been interested in innovation and the, uh, you know, what what technology can uh, can bring to society. And uh, you know, in the last uh, two uh, years or so, I've been focused in uh, sustainability at Cisco. I mean, I'm one of many at Cisco um, focused on sustainability. Uh, my area of focus is in the area of uh, collaboration solutions uh, globally. So uh, my interest today in uh, what I'd like to see is is really uh, the for good side of things. So what can AI do for good and then potential crossovers with sustainability as well. So the SDGs, you know, which SDGs apply in um, the different uh, ideas which are going to be presented and, uh, you know, the ethical side as well. So uh, making sure that this does have a positive effect uh, on uh, people, on society, on solving uh, very specific uh, problems that we are facing today. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been a, a mentor to startups in the past. I, I've also uh, ran my own startups uh, I had a period where I was really uh, focused on the startup uh, area in uh, different countries. And uh, so I'm really, uh, you know, eager to see also that crossover between uh, startups and uh, corporate innovation and uh, really uh, happy to listen to uh, the new ideas which are being presented today. So thank you uh, again, Carlo, for having me. Yeah, it's uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. So, uh, yeah, tremendous panel of judges. Uh, and now, uh, now, is, now comes the, the the real exciting part: uh, meeting the entrepreneurs, uh, finding out what their ideas are. Um, the just in terms of uh, session hygiene, there's going to be like a five minute pitch from each entrepreneur and uh, up to ten minutes of uh, Q and A from the judges. And uh, and then once we've uh, heard all of the entrepreneurs, uh, the judges will uh, retire into a private session uh, where they will be discussing uh, and um, and deciding on uh, who will be the uh, the the winning party. Uh, but uh, I'd like to say in advance that everybody is a winner getting here at this level in a contest of this magnitude um, with the United Nations ITU AI for Good platform is an incredible win. So uh, everybody comes out of this as a winner. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I'm very excited to see these presentations. So uh, I believe that uh, the next, that the presenter that will come on stage now is Ashutosh uh, Saxena. If the United Nations staff on the call tell me that there's a different order of presentation, please let me know. Otherwise I'll ask um, uh, Mr. Saxena to join uh, and present his pitch. Hi, uh, if you can help me unmute my cam, oh, sorry, unmute me and the camera. You're unmuted. Oh, uh, my camera is not uh, sharing. So let's try that. Here we go. Yeah, we see, we see you. All right, hello. Thanks, I am uh, delighted to be here. Uh, and this is a great effort and forum to bring uh, good for the society. Uh, and at Casper, we are doing it with uh, AI in the area of healthcare. So let me share my screen and go over our uh, description of what we do. Uh, we were recently awarded by American Society of Aging. We were the top AI 100 companies. And our mission is to bring healthcare to every home uh, with contactless ambient AI. So where things are evolving is that we have passive sensors that help bring healthcare in a post-operative fashion, chronic diseases in the long-term care space to every home and without using cameras or variables. Um, and the reason it is important is that uh, such a AI-driven platform will help care space across the world. We are already deployed in Japan, India, and US and Canada. We are starting in, uh, it's a massive market and the annual spend just in the US is huge. The challenge and the reasons it is so is that the current care model is labor-centric care. There is a human being who has to do everything. It is outside the context, very task-based, which makes the care very reactive. Everyone goes to the hospital or complains when they're already sick. And this is because analyzing patients is manual, 
24 by 7 care is just difficult to provide. Uh, what we should do is have AI driven care, which is proactive and preventative because it can analyze the patients in an automated fashion with millions of data points, each patient and do 24 by 7 care. And basically there is a huge tailwind and support from governments and insurance companies throughout the world to be able to do that. Um, so at Casper, what we do is we have a generative AI that obviously we focus on the guardrails first. It's trained on 150 billion data points. And we really focus on healthcare in the home with contactless devices. So these are devices that look like a hockey puck, very small, uh, go somewhere in the room. They are not cameras available, they are radar sensors. And with that, we get millions of data points per patient. Our generative pretrained transformers and LLMs use that data to predict 20 plus health and condition markers. They are integrated into EHR and alert engines. It's a HIPAA compliant AI, and we are detecting uh, conditions related to cardiac issues, respiratory issues, sleep, ambulatory. Uh, and I will play a short video here. There's a huge realignment toward home health being fueled by an aging population and changes to healthcare reimbursements. One of the biggest challenges for virtual care teams is to continuously monitor their patients remotely. Introducing Casper's contactless monitoring solution, which unlike wearables or cameras is completely non-intrusive. Our fully automated sensor-based solution collects data 24 by seven to deliver 99% adherence without requiring active patient involvement. Our revolutionary multimodal AI is trained on a proprietary data set of 150 billion data points attuned to patient activity. Using this, we extract over 20 health and wellness markers, including heart rate, respiration rate, sleep analytics, and overall activity levels. With our AI-generated care plan reports, your staff receives proactive health insights to achieve better patient outcomes. Let Casper AI work for you to unleash the power of artificial intelligence for your comprehensive care solution. Now, this solution completely transforms healthcare because many of, of, of the healthcare systems can now have access to patients' data when they leave the hospital. Uh, Long-term care, chronic condition, diabetes, kidney uh, uh, issues, management, respiratory conditions are all addressable if you can get this kind of data. In fact, even dementia conditions are very useful because many of these issues related to sleep and memory of behavioral, you need to collect data second by second. And our AI has helped our customers and we are deployed throughout the US from Florida to Hawaii to Texas to Minnesota. We are showing $140 plus per month of value add per patient to our clients. Just with our existing clients, we have a huge scope for expansion. And our customers are the change agents. They are providing virtual care, home care, or hospital at home in partnership with health systems throughout the US in homes and facilities. Um, a little bit about, I'll spend a, a half a minute here to tell you how, how we are taking the generative AI at the representation level into this healthcare space. So on the left-hand side, you are looking at second by second or sub-second of data. A patient is in the bed, and as they leave the bed, their heart rate and respiration rate was tracked, and now they go into the bathroom. So this is the actual data on the y-axis, where the person went to the bathroom, and he went to the bathroom one more time uh, again, right? Uh, multiple times. However, our generative AI is making a model of patient and saying that this patient should not be going to the bed. It must be in the bedroom. The patient must be near the bed. So it's every second, every minute, it is producing what it expects based on long-term history of the patient and short-term behaviors. If it doesn't match the, the, the reality, that's a, a problem. And our attention model look our attention models look at the short-term issues, the long-term issues, and in this particular case, it's a possible urinary tract infection because of respiration rate and other changes. And this is massively beneficial for health, health systems. Early detection is a $10 pill versus $10,000 of cost afterwards. To wrap up, um, we are growing fast. We have existing customers that we are expanding with, with a target of 14 million ARR. We are targeting newer clients as well. We have a, a great... Uh, team uh, of uh, uh, people 
who have done this before. I was a professor at Cornell University and Stanford before. We have experienced people who have exited before. So to summarize, um, we have a field tested AI technology, accelerated customer adoption, and we are on our path to become uh, and, and bring different people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate that, Ashutosh. You know, this uh, keeping it to five minutes is uh, is probably the biggest task. It's uh, it's a, an unbelievable achievement. You've gone just over, uh, but I do appreciate it. I'll ask all contestants to make sure that they keep it to uh, five minutes at the very most. So uh, thank you for that. I'll just hand over straight away to the judges uh, and uh, see if um, they have uh, questions. If you have a question, just come on screen. Um, I will be calling your names uh, sequentially uh, in, in any event. Let me start off with, uh, there you go, Wen Wen Lam. Please, uh, would you like to ask a question? We'll keep the questions fairly um, concise and uh, we have just about eight minutes now for uh, the question and answer part. Sure. Um, so I maybe I missed this, but like who are your best target customers and like how, like, like within an organization, who do you sell to? And then how are they buying, I guess? And then what does the usage look like? Yeah, so our ideal customers are care providers, whether they can provide care to homes or facilities, they often work in collaboration with health systems. They typically serve 5,000 to 100,000 patients, sometimes larger. Our typical sell is to the visionary leaders in the company, chief medical officer, chief mm. uh, uh, CEOs are our typical champions, and CFO is the usual approver because they see a top-line revenue ad working with us. On the user side, our users are the care teams, nurses, unlicensed or licensed, RNs, uh, sometimes clinicians who are willing and wanting to see uh, like how to provide better care to the patients and avoid injuries and avoid medical issues. All right. Thank, thank you, Wenwen. Uh, thank you, Ashutosh, for your answer. Sydney, would you have a question? Yeah, I was actually curious on some of the like how it works, meaning sensors, like how many sensors are having to get deployed right on someone because I, I watched the tracking and then I was actually curious as to what the adoption rate of being willing to opt in to those sensors so that you actually get accurate data looked like. And my other question is of your 150 billion like proprietary data set, how did you collect that information? Yeah. So to answer your first question, we have a minimum requirement of one sensor. Bedroom is the first place we put in because that is the maximum time people are there, whether they are healthy or sick. Uh, it sends, the sensor goes on the wall. It gives us numerous data points. Sometimes we add sensors in bathroom or other places and not cameras or wearables. These are non-intrusive sensors. Um, the second question is because we are targeting uh, the right workflows of conditions, the care reports and specific line items, our uh, adoption has been great. So we have been deployed throughout the US, mostly in facilities in the past and more recently in the homes with our clients. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, it is a rider on the care that they provide. So we are going into a relationship where there's already a care and patient relationship. We are the enablers. So consent form has been fairly straightforward to get. It's a tool for them. And lastly, uh, we, uh, the, the, the more, most important part is that the usage is easy. So we are having a good time with the nurses as the users and patients are uh, subjects for this product. Uh, on which nurses can provide better care by using our tool. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, Sydney, for the very good question and Ashutosh for your reply. Luca, it's your turn. Yes, thank you. A great presentation, Ashutosh. Just want to ask, um, in, you know, you mentioned that, um, you know, the, it's not based on wearables. Um, so what what is the limitation of having sensors instead of uh, having wearables, which have like physical or are close to the body in terms of uh, capturing uh, data. And then in terms of the uh, business model, um, you know, how do you foresee expansion beyond the US? Because I mean, the US seems to be ideal for you in terms of the kind of customers that you're aiming for. Uh, but uh, how do you see this expanding beyond the US? You know, how do you, uh, which, which, what, what is the potential like in Europe or in Asia for this? So uh, it is in some sense an alternate for variables because 
you're collecting data and you do not need to remember to charge it or have patient adherence, which causes variables to have 17, 17% adherence rate. So these sensors are better at that. There are limitations. Um, you have to be in the field of view of the sensor, so you can only collect possibly half the time the readings when they're in the home and 80%, 90% of the time for patients who are confined to bed. Uh, but that's is still great because getting heart rate and respiration rate 1,000 times a day is still enough data, right? Um, so, uh, and the tech way technology works is that instead of having one measurement point here, which second each lets you collect a lot more data about motions is you're having back pain pressure injury issues so in some sense you're getting different data from these sensors um to answer your what was your second question sorry on the business model it was expanding beyond the us so what, what do you foresee as uh, the potential beyond the us so we are actually live in India. Uh, we just started working with Canadian agency called Center of Aging and Brain Health Innovation. They have 85 different health systems. So we are already working on the pilots in Canada. Um, we are signing on clients in Japan as well for the Asian market. Uh, so currently we are uh, live in US expanding and starting to expand in India, Japan and Canada. But look forward to coming to Europe as well if we get some help and partnerships settled. Thank you. Thank you both. This was a, a really good uh, uh, start to the session. Great questions, uh, great uh, replies. Uh, just goes to show the incredible strength of this uh, of this uh, panel of judges and this panel of entrepreneurs. Uh, moving on, uh, Ashutosh, I'll, I'd like to ask you to take off the webcam and I'll ask now, the next uh, distinguished contestant to come on and present, that would be Guidewire. You have five minutes precisely to run through your deck. Welcome. Thank you so much. My name is Raj Shah and I'm the CEO of Guidewire RX. My company is focused on saving lives and limbs with AI-driven early detection of chronic vascular disease. Our company's vision aligns with sustainable development goals of good health and well-being reduced inequalities, and responsible consumption. Chronic vascular disease is the number one killer and accounts for a third of all deaths globally. It's also a major contributor to disability and long-term suffering. All of us have had the shadow of vascular disease fall on our families or friends. As doctors, my co-founder and I see these patients in our interventional radiology practice every single day. What's shocking is that 85% of these outcomes, heart attack-related deaths, strokes and amputations are completely preventable with early diagnosis and timely care. To put this in perspective, the number of heart attack related deaths, strokes and amputations are comparable to the populations of New York, London and Amsterdam. We don't have to settle for this and we don't need to lose a New York every year. And we definitely don't need to wait till the next century to improve this situation. Let's look at some of the disparities in chronic vascular disease. There are striking geographic disparities with particularly high rates of disease in Asia, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and Northern Africa. 80% of chronic vascular disease deaths worldwide occur in developing countries. For example, India has 18% of the world's population and 60% of the global chronic vascular disease burden. Early detection of chronic vascular disease, which drives appropriate care, can reduce racial, gender, and socioeconomic disparities. Persons of color are disproportionately affected in the US. Non-white Americans are two to four times more likely to suffer an amputation than white Americans. Women have poorer outcomes and lower detection rates than men. And lower income is associated with high rates of peripheral vascular disease related amputation. Let's look at one of the big root causes of these poor outcomes and disparities and how we can address them using AI. In radiology, there's a failure to identify and characterize chronic vascular disease. This is a problem because these patients are underdiagnosed and undertreated by our healthcare system, ending up with heart, attack related, heart attacks, strokes, and amputations. These are poor outcomes associated with permanent disability and death and high healthcare costs in the trillions of dollars. On an average day, in a span of five hours, a radiologist such as myself will look at 50 CT scans. A CT scan can have up to 4,000 images, and we have on average six minutes to perform our assessment. That's reviewing 11 images a second. It's absurd, but that's the reality of the high pressure environment we practice in today. 88% of radiologists globally report burnout. The amount of data to analyze and interpret is overwhelming. 
and markers of vascular disease are easy to miss. These are often subtle but important findings that are frequently missed, underreported, or poorly characterized. And as a result, patients are not treated appropriately, and this results in poor outcomes. There's a global shortage of radiologists. Radiologists are concentrated in developed countries. And again, there are broad disparities here. Look at the ratio of radiologists to people in the US versus India versus Sub-Saharan Africa. How many years is it gonna to take to eliminate these disparities? We can do better than this quickly with AI. The massive potential to impact and improve human life can't be stressed enough. Early diagnosis of chronic vascular disease using AI can prevent heart attack, stroke, and amputation. This is a huge market. AI and medical imaging is a $6 billion market today, growing to $20 billion in five years. Our solution addresses this failure to identify disease from medical imaging. This is our first product of multiple chronic disease solutions. Our AI solution is widely applicable to 45% of all contrast enhanced CT scans performed worldwide. It's also accurate, fast, and secure, allowing instant interpretation for the radiologist with little to no friction in terms of workflow integration. So we're using peripheral vascular disease as a marker that's widely prevalent on imaging studies to diagnose and treat the full spectrum of cardiovascular disease and prevent heart attack, stroke, and amputation. Our platform runs on the radiologist workstation and communicates with the radiology information system. Our technology identifies patients with significant vascular disease and activates the right team of physicians to treat these patients. Our solution benefits patients, physicians, and payers. So for radiologists, we're improving accuracy of diagnosis, efficiency, and reducing burnout. For vascular physicians, we're helping drive appropriate care by getting these patients treated. And for payers, we're reducing the economic burden of disease by lowering lifetime costs related to suffering from these poor outcomes, long-term care costs, and lost work days. We're also reducing costs related to misdiagnosis and inappropriate care. So AI and medical imaging is an emerging, fast-growing market poised for tremendous growth over the next several years. The overall market is growing at 28% as, as shown here. We have a strong value proposition for multiple stakeholders and aim to reach patients all over the world by partnering with leading medical imaging companies. Any hospital with a CT scanner can use our technology to detect disease and if necessary, direct patients to appropriate advanced care centers to treat with minimally invasive angiography and interventions. This is our founders team. We're a physician driven company creating a healthcare product with an in-depth understanding of radiologists, hospitals, payers, and device companies. Luke Higgins and I are interventional radiologists. I trained at Miami Vascular Institute. Luke trained at Stanford, Johns Hopkins, Harvard, and MIT. And Prolod Menon is our CTO. Our vision is to improve lives by reducing the rate of heart attack, stroke, and amputation through AI-driven timely disease detection. And we believe we can get there with Guidewire RX. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Thank you for uh, doing your best to keep the time. You did a great presentation uh, and you, you got a very noble cause there, uh, what you're trying to achieve. So thank you very much. It's very inspiring. Uh, I'll um, um, ask the judges to come on straight away on camera and uh, start asking questions. We'll uh, keep this uh, question and answer piece to just about under nine minutes so that we can stay to timetable. Thank you. Sydney, you go first. Yeah. Okay. So on the one of the first slides, you talked about you know eighty five percent of the the um, deaths in these three categories were preventable. But my yeah. question is, um, I think from I understand the solution, a lot of the solution depends on CT scans, which are sometimes before the preventable moments. So what does that kind of market size reduce to when you look at that? Because I think you need some qualifying scan or activity in order to help predict outcomes. So a percentage right. of those eighty five that are preventable get to that point for them that you then see that you can help them and what's the gap between what could have happened or would have happened if you catch them in the, in the moment of some scan or radiology event. Absolutely. Great question. So patients with vascular disease are walking around going into emergency departments for other causes, right? A patient get a, can get a CT of the abdomen pelvis for a gallbladder issue, pancreatitis, cancer, back pain, whatever it may be. So vascular disease is present. Um, and often, the radiologist sees it, but just doesn't report it or underdiagnosis it. So uh, to answer your question, you know, what does that market size entail? So it really depends on how severe the disease is and how symptomatic the patient is. So the patient, in the case of peripheral vascular disease, 50% of patients are asymptomatic, right? Um, so in that case, we're not actually treating those patients with a procedure. But even if we can get them to medical management, diabetes control, high blood pressure control, cholesterol control, that itself uh, can prolong life and reduce uh, 
reduce the rate of these poor outcomes. Um, so, it, you know, I, I don't have a number for you, but, um, you know, you have to really look at a case by case scenario for each patient that's being identified. Right. So if I restate, there's this interesting opportunity of you think you can identify things like cardiovascular disease in scans that are not just of the heart, of right. other conditions. Um, and the opportunity is in, can we better treat preventable outcomes from patients who come into a facility and actually see an issue versus right. the ones who are walking around and don't know it? That one's a harder one because that's a different kind of, you know, determinant, social determinants of health. And this one's in a different space. Right. Absolutely. Thank you, Sydney. Uh, who would like to go next? Uh, uh, Luca? Uh, yes, thanks, Luca? Um, Carlo. Um... So yeah, my, my question is uh, relating to the monetization model. I like your benefits uh, slide where you showed you know who would benefit from this, but who are your buyers and uh, you know what is your plan to monetize this uh, this solution? Absolutely, great question. So the product champions of this technology uh, would be the radiologist because we're directly improving accuracy of diagnosis and quality of reporting. Um, it would also be championed by the vascular medicine doctor, as well as the hospital C-suite. So 90% of patients with peripheral vascular disease are either underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed. So these are revenue opportunities that the hospital is missing. Um, and by the way, these revenue opportunities are very lucrative for hospitals. So for example, a patient that undergoes a lower extremity angiography that I would treat, the hospital could get reimbursed between fifteen dollars and $25,000 per procedure. So it's in the hospital's best interest uh, financially uh, to have this type, this type of software with, where they can identify more vascular disease patients in their local geography. So we're, se our, we're selling it as a software, as a service uh, product to hospitals to help them capture this disease. Any hospital with a CT scanner, but it would be championed by multiple people within the hospital system, uh, the radiologist, uh, the hospital C-suite, and the vascular medicine doctor. And just a quick follow-up question. Do you have any customers today? No. So we're an early stage company. Uh, uh, our product is in the prototype stage. Uh, we've raised some money in our pre-seed round. We have a data sharing relationship with the largest teleradiology company in the U.S. called VRAD. Uh, and we're using that data from across the U.S. to train our model on heterogeneous um, uh, ethnically and geographically heterogeneous data. So we aim to get a physician-facing product um, to VRED in six months, and hopefully an FDA 510K cleared software, uh, software as a medical device in a year and a half. Great. Thank you very much. Thank as you. A, when, when, as please. A, oops, sorry. As a follow-up to that, um, like because there are so many stakeholders that you sell to, who do you actually think thinks makes the decision financially to buy? And then also who makes the decision to use it? Because I think we we actually have a company called Rad AI in our portfolio that does something similar. And I right. think they've struggled pretty hard to, to go find go to market. So we'd love to hear about that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll, I'll answer both of those questions. So we're selling, so the radiologist is really the user of this technology. Uh, they're the first person, um, they're, they're the first uh, individuals to kind of see the technology. Uh, it's helping them identify the disease, but really the entire hospital system is benefiting uh, from this through better care coordination, identifying these patients uh, and getting them treated, which again uh, is a revenue to hospitals. Um, there are other AI companies uh, right now, like AI Doc, Viz AI, Rapid AI. Um, I think uh, the one you mentioned, I'm not sure, but they are mostly focusing on acute disease. So emergency scenarios for prioritization of studies. Our solution is different in that, you know, we're helping radiologists identify a disease process that they may not necessarily be looking for, thereby avoiding the missed or underreported finding. We're also not focusing purely on prioritization. We're focused on AI-driven image activation to drive appropriate care for vascular disease. And chronic disease provides greater downstream revenue opportunities for customers. These are patients for life, requiring regular surveillance, follow-up, and sometimes multiple minimally invasive procedures. So I think to get to your first question, the hospital C-suite would play a major role in uh, adopting this technology, wanting this technology, because, because it would help their bottom line. It would improve patient outcomes uh, for the hospital. It also, um, by identifying these patients early, uh, I think getting to, to one of Cindy's questions, um, 
we are facilitating a long-term relationship between the patient and the hospital, thereby re uh, reducing patient referral leakage. So studies have shown that 90% of claims come from a single hospital system. So by identifying these patients early, um, we're reducing patient referral leakage, facilitating a long-term relationship for chronic disease management. Okay, guys, that was outstanding. Outstanding presentation, outstanding answers, um, a commendable work. And uh, sounds like you got it, you know, quite well buttoned up. Uh, congratulations, Raj and uh, and team. It's good to see clinicians uh, uh, be entrepreneurs as well. It's uh, it's an absolute joy. Um, so thank you for your presentation. I'll ask you to come off. And the next person to join me will be from ASD.me. Uh, Michael Johnson, welcome. And uh, the floor is yours for just under five minutes. Perfect. Greetings. So let me, my name is Michael Johnson, and I am the CEO of ASD.me, the nation's first nationwide healthcare technology company tailored exclusively for innovating autism spectrum diagnostics. And if I could just take a moment to share my screen. Excellent. So we specialize in remote telehealth screenings using our proprietary tools and best practices to confirm or rule out an autism diagnosis as outlined by the American Academy of Pediatrics. According Michael, to the CDC, you know, yeah. just, you know the, the, the screen share is on top. Oh, I'm so sorry. There hey, no go. problem at all. <laughs> I'll take it back. Can we, can we start over on the time? Uh, not really, no. <laughs> okay, no worries. <laughs> yeah. Screen share. Okay, you got it. Thanks. Okay, we should be fine. Okay, so we specialize in remote telehealth screenings using our proprietary tools and best practices to confirm or rule out a diagnosis of autism as outlined by the American Academy of Pediatrics. So according to the CDC, one in 36 kids in the United States will be diagnosed with autism annually, one in 36. And there's a tremendous demand for timely, more efficient, autism behavioral evaluations and diagnoses. And to our knowledge, there is no real-time translation telehealth diagnostic platform capable of providing access to virtual therapeutic care to patients anywhere in the world. ASD.me, we've developed the first AI-centric digital clinic with real-time language translation exclusively for diagnosing autism. Now, parents and caregivers need a positive ASD diagnostic report to access special education school programs, therapeutic care, and financial support. They cannot obtain treatment without it. And then COVID heightened the demand, and more importantly, the acceptance of medical and psychological telehealth uses, putting us in, a, in an ideal place at this time. Of the eight white papers that reported on reliability and accuracy, using telehealth methods to diagnose autism was found 80 to 91% accurate when compared to traditional in-person evaluations. Now, behind the scenes, excuse me, behind the screens and computer monitors, our patent pending AI telehealth platform captures and analyzes de-identified HIPAA compliant time sync audio files, video files, and sensory motor biometrics, much like Facial recognition software. We analyze the alignment of events, including time analysis, the child's posture, hand positions, audio responses, eye movements, the gait when they're walking, and other bio data inputs. This data is ingested, and we leverage AI, ML, and NLP transcription to identify patterns that correlate with specific neurodiverse outcomes, starting with the autism spectrum. Our real-time language translation solutions allows for global collaboration and therapeutic care anywhere in the world. Our patent pending AI diagnostic report generator system reduces the time for clinicians to write the post-diagnostic reports from one to three hours per patient down to 10 to 20 minutes. Total addressable global digital health market size was 217 billion in 2022. It's estimated to reach 1.5 trillion by 2032 at a compound growth, average growth rate of 25.3%. Now, who are our patients? There are 3.6 million US births annually, resulting in a total addressable market 
of $47.5 billion. Evaluating one out of every 20 kids from age 18 months to seven years old equals a serviceable addressable U.S. market of $2.4 billion. Taking a page from the Amazon model, by eliminating traditional brick and mortar CapEx, we pay our PhD licensed clinicians 26% higher starting base salaries. And we reduce the cost of diagnostic care and we reduce the cost to our parents, caregivers, and insurance payers. We've assembled a highly accomplished management team. Their achievements include overseeing the Medicaid program for the state of California, developing the first ethnic targeted web and mobile platforms for the automotive, beverage, and pharmaceutical industries, and leading the anti-hacking groups for Cisco Systems and the United States Federal Reserve System. In summary, ASD.me, we're gonna impact tens of thousands of small children's lives globally, promoting good health and well-being, driving industry innovation, reducing health inequalities and equities. We're leveraging AI for good in the world. And by making access to the gold standard of diagnostic care, we're gonna make that care available to everybody. That's ASD.me, thank you for your time. And I look forward to your questions. Uh, Michael Johnson, uh, really beautifully delivered. Great work. There's a, a um, autism epidemic and, uh, and it's really nice to, to see this kind of solution come through. I mean, who's not on the spectrum these days, right? right. So, amazing. So uh, let me please ask the judges to jump on. You've got uh, uh, 10 minutes to uh, question Michael. And I will pick on one judge right there. Sydney, I was just about to pick on you. <laughs> Perfect. Good timing. <laughs> Hey, well, you, I was um, curious as to in your go to market strategy, kind of a common question we've been asking, right? How are you reaching your target customer and who's paying? And like, what does that average deal size look like as you try to reach out? Because sometimes this is an unfunded space. So I'm just right. interested in how you think about go to market and reaching those customers and the payment side of it. Excellent. And a little more so depth. The first question, we have we have two, two, or two primary methods to target our patients. Number one, we're direct to consumer. So we're using social media. Um, in the month of October, 2023, on a $200 a day spend on social media in California alone, we had over 420 parents come to our website and sign up for an evaluation. <laughs> so that validated the use of our product, the need for our product. So we actually stopped the business we're in the middle of a SPVC round right now because there's a significant need for us to hire at an aggressive rate more child psychologists to meet that demand. Price point. The reason we got into this business, when I first looked at it, um, I wasn't that interested. We have a parent company. I'm the chairman of the parent company, M Healthcare. So we're a data-centric research company. Um, we've actually got an EEG headset um, and a partnership with the state of New York and going into a clinical trial where that EEG headset is capturing brainwave data and we're using AI to uh, in a nonlinear algorithm, and in a clinical trial with Boston Children clinical study with Boston Children's Hospital, that EEG brainwave AI uh, nonlinear algorithm came back with a ninety five percent efficacy, determining if you could if a child was going to be on the autism spectrum or not. And that's when we got involved with ASD.me. So the rate of reimbursement for behavioral health averages between one hundred and fifty dollars to like three hundred and fifty dollars. Because uh, uh, autism is a specialty diagnostic and requires multiple sessions, the rate of care averages between $3,500 up to $6,000 per patient. Our price point is $2,400. Did you figure out what your cost of customer acquisition was from the test that you ran or what you anticipate it will be? And does that mean you have to raise more capital because of that go-to-market strategy? Uh, we're raising capital right now. The demand is there. The, the problem, and there's another significant problem, and thank you for the question, there's a tremendous uh, wait list if you want to have a behavioral health evaluation. Anywhere between uh, eight to 12 months in places like New York and California to as many as two years in rural markets, there's a significant demand. So we're actually rising up to meet that demand with a more available solution where patients can get care in the comfort of their home um, and the cost for that, again, going back to our, our modeling, we're, we're paying $200 uh, to get you know, over 400 parents 
And at a price point of $2,400, uh, we're on tra a trajectory, if we meet our objectives, to be at $495 million by year five. Got it. Um, I have a question. What does kind of like ongoing care look like after diagnostics and just kind of like for um, like um, a little bit of um, color? I actually have a brother that's autistic, mm -hmm. right? Right, right. Like, I mean, there's like many stages as, you know, these kids get older and stuff. Like, what does that look like? So great question. We actually strategically stop at the diagnosis and we stop at the diagnosis because the court of public opinion. We don't want the perception to be that ASD.me is profiting from a false positive. So we're building a network of referrals, a referral-based network of ABA therapy clinics and, and therapy centers um, where once we make the diagnosis, we can then meet with that parent. We have a post-diagnostic specialist on our team who meet with the parents who have a positive outcome. They give them all the information, the next steps and financial tools to gain care for their child. And then we make sure we position them with an ABA therapy center or a speech therapist or whatever the diagnostic clinician has referred for that patient. Thank you. Oh, yeah, uh, Luca. Yeah. Great presentation, Michael. Thanks. Um, my question is, you know, since you're, uh, you know, working on a B2C uh, business model, you know, and, and um, you know, you need practitioners to uh, assess, um, you know, um, the conditions of the patients. How, how do you assure, you know, that you have enough practitioners to expand at the rate that you want to expand? You know, how, how do you get them to you know, keep loyal to you and uh, you know what is the model there with, with the practitioners? Okay, so one of our major differentiators is we on, we only hire full time state licensed PhD clinicians. Believe it or not, the median salary, the median income for a PhD psychologist is seventy nine thousand six hundred dollars a year. Our clinicians start at one hundred twenty thousand dollars. They have. $10,000 annual bonuses, $10,000 annual increases based on performance, a four-day work week, and the comfort of working from home, seeing two patients a day, four days a week. Our plan is to scale at 10 clinicians a month starting in May, and at that rate of scale, we'll achieve the targets that we just discussed. Great. Thank you. Well, I'd like to have a job as a clinician with you, <laughs> Michael. <laughs> thank you. That's amazing. So listen, thank you very much for this great presentation uh, and good luck with uh, the process. And uh, I am ready. Before actually uh, bringing the next company on board, I just wanted to um, mention to the audience watching us on, um, on, on the AI for Good Neural Network or other platforms, if um, if you like, you can actually ask questions of your own, and uh, please do so within the um, chat room that is available within the AI for Good Neural Network. So please don't miss out on the opportunity to feel free to ask questions, and then uh, there will be uh, an interlude while the judges make up their decisions, and we'll be able to um, handle some of those questions as well at that point. Um, okay, so that said, I'm ready to welcome to the uh, to to the podium um, uh, stimuli, Taylor Taylor Shee. Welcome. Hi everyone. My name is Taylor Shed. I'm the founder and CEO of Stimuli Studios. We believe we are creating the future of learning and workforce development, and I think everybody listening would agree that learning and workforce development is something that touches everybody on the planet, or should. Our company mission is to educate the world and change the future. And our why is that failing education systems impact health and well-being of people worldwide. In America, they disproportionately affect black and brown learners everywhere. Let's talk about some of the problems. We believe that education gaps in K-12 impact workforce readiness. Many people don't know this, but 77% of eighth graders don't get any sort of two or four year degree. Only 18% of K-12 curriculum aligns with workforce needs. And those that graduate college are actually nine times um, likely to live nine years more than those that don't graduate and finish high school. This is not just a problem that impacts the U.S. And in fact, it is a problem that's even bigger scale worldwide. There are 435 million global jobs um, that are not filled worldwide. And it impacts nations of lower income greater, um, almost three times higher than it does of nations with uh, higher income. 
So with that said, let's take a look at why this is happening. These three platforms that you'll see here, I jokingly say they look older than MySpace but they're educating millions of learners worldwide and they're making billions of dollars doing it annually. What these platforms lack is engagement, personalization, relevance, and career training, leading to over 75% of learners being disengaged in class every single day. This is our future workforce. At Stimuli, we want you to imagine if learning was somewhere between movies and games, an interactive movie, a never ending game that reacts to you, a shaping world. That's how we're using AI. As far as my knowledge and research, we are the only company combining education and career pathways into an AI powered video game. Think about this. Every lesson that you ever learned in K-12 or in college, there being an immersive, personalized quest built just for you. If we're all learning about volume of a cylinder, instead of us just learning it because we have to and we're told it's relevant to our future jobs, we will learn these things based upon what our career interests are, who we are as a person. That's something that has totally been missed in education today. What we consider personalized ed learning in education today is, you got this answer right, so we're gonna challenge you to do something harder. You got this answer wrong, we're gonna take you back. In this type of world, you can have hands-on learning experiences where you're learning in a way that's suited for you. So how does this work? First, we gather data on a user through a career discovery experience. We then analyze what they're supposed to learn next in school. And by the way, we can integrate any third-party content into this platform and this tool. And what we spit out then is an immersive educational quest specific to that user. If you wanna know the outcomes that we've had at Stimuli, we've helped prepare thousands, tens of thousands of students in Dallas for jobs making 60 to $70,000 upon high school graduation. When we released our first video game, we saw that students in one of the lowest income districts in the state were reaching meets and mastery at a rate of 93%. And this is sh shocking statistic. Only 25% of eighth graders today are actually proficient in eighth grade math. So we completely blew that out the water. And last but not least, the Gates Foundation funded us in order to accelerate our AI um, development with a focus on how to increase motivation, engagement, and persistence in math for Black, Brown, and low-income learners. The market opportunity is huge. We're combining lifelong learning with gaming. If you're asking yourself how many people like games, there's 3.3 billion gamers worldwide with an average age of 36. So what's our fastest path to scale? By partnering with content publishers like Stride and McGraw-Hill, who we already have as existing clients, and putting their content into our platform and creating these immersive quests, we were able to reach millions of learners. We're also uh, partnered with the Texoma Semiconductor Tech Hub, where we are the leading workforce development partner uh, for the semiconductor industry, and we're leveraging non-dilutive capital to make our dollar go further. This is the largest upgrade to education infrastructure in history, and we will reach over 2 million learners in the next 12 months, and we're already reaching 100,000, but that's through signed contracts. Here's a look at the Tech Hub. Uh, serving 8.5 million people. It's the largest one in the country, all focused on semiconductor manufacturing. And here's a look at the team that has expertise across Disney, Pixar, educational games, um, and consulting that's delivering this product. I think I landed right at five minutes. You did absolutely great. And what an inspiring idea. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm really humbled and uh, and excited about what you're presenting. So uh, I'm going to call up the judges straight away. I'll ask them to put across a concise question each, and uh, we'll have a concise answer. But this is uh, very impressive work. Thank you, Taylor. Um, which of the judges would like to come forth first? Um, I'm happy to have some questions about how you structure the the um, contracts and like what your actual target is. So like I'm quite curious. Like you you kind of range from being like a B to C, and then then you you went into like you know like distribution through contracts. Can you talk about how that works and what you're going to focus on? Sure. So just historically, we started by selling directly to school districts. Um, mm -hmm. That's a long procurement cycle, but we still were very effective and learned a lot of our research and proved our effectiveness there. As far as our fastest path to scale, um, we're working with the largest online public school in the United States, who serves two hundred thousand learners. They're signing up a contract with us um, that's at $25 per student to serve all of their learners. 
And so effectively we bring their content into our world. Our AI generates these immersive quests and the learners, instead of using the platform that I referenced was older than MySpace or using our technology. There is a future point in time where we go direct to consumer and, and we have a global launch. But one of the things that we're doing is we're doing this like a video game, which has never been done before in education. And I would compare that to how Apple produced the 1984 commercial um, or Michael Jackson's thriller uh, music video. So really taking an approach that we know works well in consumer market and bring it into a space that's in desperate need of disruption. Cool. Thank you, Wenwen. Uh, Sid, Sid, Sydney or uh, Sid or uh, Luca? There, yeah, Sydney. Bless you. My camera froze for a second. Um, you know, at the very beginning, you had the stat around of like seventy-seven percent of the eighth graders, you know, won't go to higher ed. Have you started to see that number change? I mean, we all know we need higher ed transformation. We need students to get education. Like, what indicators do you have that this is creating change? That our platform is creating change? Yeah. Um, so uh, if you look at the outcome I pointed out where I said that we help tens of thousands of students graduate high school making sixty to $70,000 per year, um, most people in public schools in the Dallas County area are living below the poverty line. So they might be averaging about 30000 a year in earnings. And so we're literally doubling that by the time that they graduate um, high school. So that's one impact. And another thing that I'll point out is I'm obsessed with the semiconductor industry that Tech Hub I refer to as focus on the semiconductor industry. And there's two things that people don't know about that. So Texas Instruments or Samsung will tell you their largest gap is actually in technicians and operators are in these factories. And so to be a technician or operator, really all you need is to graduate high school and then to get a level one certification. And so as far as how that's changing, I think what we're recognizing is you don't actually have to you know, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars or two to four years in order to get skills that you need to actually bring your family out of poverty. And so we've actually seen the, in-cap, um, the impact through the curriculum we've developed. But when you talk to these companies, they're telling us that that's the largest gap. And in the semiconductor industry, you know, it powers all technologies. And one thing that a lot of people don't know is for every job that's created in the semiconductor industry, it creates seven in adjacent industries. So the economic impact you can expect to see is just tremendous from something like this. Absolutely. And have you extended all the way into the partnerships on the certificate type programs outside of just graduation, which... Yes, um, that's oftentimes delivered through the community college. And so we're yep. kind of like a navigation and a compass that tells somebody like, here's who you are. Here's where you are in your educational journey. Even if you've dropped out after high school, you get into our program and you can kind of see a map of the resources mapped to your interests, what jobs are nearby you, what jobs are matched to your skill sets, and then how do you get those training and certification programs? And I'll just take a moment to say that we so deeply care about scale and impact that we're starting to work with workforce development agencies where our application is actually loaded on the computers in those agencies and they're in libraries. And so really this is something that we think should be used like Google Maps. Every time we all think about where we wanna go in the world, like education and job training should have the same thing. And right now that does not exist for any of us. Yeah, I, we could have a whole other conversation on AI in that because I think that's how you meet people where they're at having real conversations because it's too hard to navigate otherwise they don't know where to go yeah and in job centers like workforce development agencies a lot of people don't know this but you have to go in and say i'm low income i don't have transportation i don't have um child care i'm food insecure and so the ability to develop empathy with ai and to serve more people all of our workforce development agencies need revamping and so to have a digital presence where people feel welcome and they don't feel like they're you know, shaming themselves is going to be a very powerful tool and a great use of AI for empathy. Hey, uh, Taylor, uh, great presentation. Uh, congrats. I just want to ask you about, would you say the gaming is the key differentiator here, bringing together AI with gamification, with education, but then, you know, the actual gamification is is where you bring a lot of value, you know, to this area of society. And uh, in that case, you know, how do you envisage to keep, you know, gamers loyal to you? Because I mean, the, you know, you have to keep updating these, these, uh, you know, the gamification side of things, you know, sure. and and keep it fresh. 
you know, how 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 do you aim to keep those gamers loyal to you or even attract, you know, gamers to work with you? Sure. So um, to the first part of your question, and it's a great question, is the game is one of the key differentiators. And the reason why is um, if you have a simulated life in a game, we can learn everything that we need to know about you in order to then personalize learning for you at a higher rate. Right. So we all walk around in the world and like, our phones might, you know, know everything we're doing. And then like certain cameras might know things we're doing, but there's no way to capture all the data on what we actually do, who we like to talk to, how much time we've been talking versus listening, what ads we're looking at. This gamified world um, is an opportunity to grab the most robust amount of data in order to personalize it in a way that actually benefits you. And then as far as how you keep gamers um, involved, what's really great is there's games that have proven the ability to do that. So Minecraft, Fortnite, The Sims, um, all of these games have had people of all ages engage with them for over decades. And so the way that we'll do that, it stimulates two ways. We already have some of the best game developers in the world working on our product. That's why it looks so different than anything you've seen in education. And then two, when you're adding value to somebody's life on a daily basis, there's some brand value that's attached to it. The last thing is the way our tools are being developed um, and the way the AI is being developed there's not a mark, there's not a video game that on the fly is generating based upon the activities that you're doing in the game. So this truly is going to be a new version of video gaming. That's what we believe we're creating a new product category called generative gaming. And it's going to evolve to you in real time. And that is what the power of AI is. And if you look at Mark and Driesen, if you look at Sam Altman, all of them have said movies are going to be more like video games and video games are going to be in a place that they've never been. And so we're one of the only companies that's ambitious enough to say um, video games, the best use case of them is going to be in education and workforce development. And education should not stop when you leave the school system. It's something that should continue throughout your entire life. You can have fun doing it. You can do it with your friends, but ultimately you can become the best person you can be in an environment like this. Thank you, Taylor. Yeah, thank you indeed, uh, Taylor, and thank you, Luca, and uh, and the judges for your very, very pertinent and intelligent questions. Um, this was really inspiring. I'll uh, catch you in a minute. And now uh, I would like to invite the, the last contestant, uh, a company called Sworn, uh, to come on. And you have the floor, Sean, for uh, five minutes precisely. Go right ahead. Last, but hopefully not least, everybody did a great job, and uh, it's so fascinating to see all the amazing tech that is being brought into this world uh, with people who are dedicated to um, doing good things. So thank you all. It's my honor to be with you here today. My name is Sean Bear. I'm the CTO of Sworn.ai, and I was a crime analyst and a police officer, and I have three more years to live. According to stats, officers live on average of 57 years. I'm 54 years old right now. I was diagnosed with heart disease at age 51. Police officers experience PTSD and heart attacks five times greater than the general population. Resignations are up, recruitment is down, and suicide is the biggest cause of death among police officers. We at Sworn are dedicated to improving the health and the well being of our first responders. We'll leverage the power of AI uh, to analyze the four main pillars of health, sleep, fitness, nutrition, and experience. This will have three critical outcomes. It'll help save lives of first responders, lower societal costs, and improve interaction between the public and the police. Well, how big really is this problem? Well, there are 40 million police officers and firefighters in the world. There's a massive market and their health and well-being has become a critical issue uh, today. For every dollar that is spent in this world, three cents is spent on public safety or 3%. This has enormous financial impacts as well. So how do we actually improve the health and well-being of first responders at Sworn? We leverage biotech and, and first responder data to track, to analyze, and to predict, and then also to coach first responders and matters involving their health and their well-being. We capture data in a variety of ways. We use a body-worn camera, which you're probably familiar with. We use something called an aura ring, which is what I'm wearing. It tracks my sleep. And other biometric devices like Fitbits and Apple Watches and, and anything that uh, we can get data from. We also gather experience data, which is very unique. 
It's robust data um, about their activities that include the computer-aided dispatch uh, calls for service, offense data, workload, and other stressor data that they encounter. We'll also use very simple and short surveys if data is not available through text where they can take a survey and, and be able to respond uh, within 10 seconds. First responders then set SMART goals, which help them to make meaningful steps toward their health and their well-being. And then we'll use analytics to track and display the progress so they always know how well they're doing using very uh, easy and insightful visual graphs. The four pillars of health will be tracked using an innovative visual display to cue them into areas of their performance, as you see there. And as they complete sections and rings in the four pillars, the sections being training, goal setting, and achievement, the sections will be filled to visually indicate how well they're doing and their growth. Points will be plotted to show observations related to those items of sleep and nutrition, fitness, and their experience. So how do we leverage AI for good? By way of example, we use machine learning and natural language processing to analyze body-worn camera footage for sentiment uh, analysis and also to uncover stressors and intensity. We'll also use large language models to cull vast libraries of data that we have and we're amassing right now that include publications and videos and other government documents that help people understand those four pillars of health. And then we'll also individualize and, and pro provide, present the information to the person uh, based on the data that is going to be salient to them at that time. We focus specifically on the UN's uh, SDG number 16, Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions. We also feel, as you can imagine, that we have a good um, contribution to good health and well-being, as well as a few other ones as well. So how can we do this? Are we able to do this? Well, my previous company was a predictive analytics company with our primary customer being public safety. We've always had a public good focus and wrote the world's first free, free to the public and free to police public crime map to keep the public informed. Um, I wrote my first neural network back in 1992 and have since wrote numerous natural language processing programs and predictive analytics software that is still in use by thousands of agencies worldwide. We have beta customers. They're already uh, providing us data and we're ready to, to go. The market is quite large, but we're gonna focus on US agencies first. We have a team dedicated to this that have been in the business for a long time. And thank you. Sean, stunning, stunning work. Uh, thank you for sharing these uh, um, inspiring insights with us. Um, I'll ask uh, the judges to step in right now and um, uh, ask some uh, concise questions. Uh, when, when you're first. Yeah. So question like why this market? I've actually seen um, other stuff in this in this particular space. There's one called prepared. Um, and, you know, um, and recently doing this whole American dynamism thing. Right. That's kind of along these lines. How did you kind of like get so interested in this? And um yeah, like what? Why? Why this market? Because like one thing I I like it because it's like very mission driven, but then it's also a bit you know like could be a bit capped, I guess. Uh, so forty million potential uh, users. Uh, that's that's a bit. That's a lot, and those those dollars are government dollars. So that's a it's a a pretty robust opportunity as it relates to just the financials of it. Um, we're interested in this market because this is our understanding. These are our expertise. So I've been in public safety since 1989. I've been a police officer. I've been a crime analyst. I've ran a predictive analytics company. I sold the LexisNexis. I've taught through the National Institute of Justice. I understand this space inside and out. And I understand, having been in this space as much as I have, how uh, critical it is right now for our first responders. And it's becoming uh, at a critical point where they're having difficulty hiring uh, first responders to be able to do the job. And they're losing first responders faster as you can imagine than attrition will allow uh, or replacement will allow. So it's not only a financial uh, endeavor, but it's also a purpose for good. Um, most of us that are on the team are doing this um, as not our, our primary day job, in the sense that we've made exits and we have the financial uh, ability to be able to do something 
because it might not have the best financial impact, but it's going to have the best uh, impact for good in, in our mind. All right. Thank you for that question. Do we have a question uh, from the other judges? Go right ahead. Kind of tagging along to that last question, obviously you've got an immense amount of amazing experience, which empowers you to go solve this problem. In the technology solution space, do you feel like the um, really the unique differentiator is sitting around the evaluation of what's happening with the body cams? Because you know, there's there's lots of other common elements in that around nutrition and sleep and those kind of things. Like, what is the thing that you look at and you say? Like this is so unique to the market that we're serving that it is what's going to drive the adoption faster. Excellent question. We saw a void in the market right now. As you point out, there are a lot of technology technologies that also uh, help people with all those four pillars um, with biotech and other types of devices, but nothing that incorporates or allows the the officer and the agency and, and, and firefighters as well to look at their experience data. That's the differentiator. And the experience data is not easy to get at. That's something that again, through experience, we understand how to do that. That is very robust data, it's big data, it's very um, uh, codified, and you almost need to speak the language to understand it. And that's really where the good data is at. The data that demonstrates or has uh, their experiences, their activities throughout the day. So they're getting gas, they're going on a, an armed robbery call, they impound evidence. Literally everything that a first responder does throughout his or her day is categorized through these systems uh, down to the, the second. And usually there's not much more than about 15 minutes of unaccounted for time in an officer's day. So nobody's tapping into that data. And we know through AI that we'll be able to leverage that data as done before and be able to understand deeper how their stressors are actually um, occurring or the stressors that, that impact them throughout their day, other than body-worn camera, other than biometric data. Mm -hmm. How do you think about the privacy of that data? Like this is a really interesting space where you've got things like grandma laws, right? like all of these things. Yeah. That as soon as it's recorded, it becomes sometimes publicly accessible, which you may or may not want in this type of an industry. So yeah. how do you think about that in this space? I love that. So the the data is what's called, it, it falls underneath the CGIS compliancy, which we have servers that are CGIS compliant, criminal justice information systems. So we know how to cross those bridges. We understand all the technicalities and legalities of the data and the systems that we have to interact with. We're not capturing HIPAA data. That was one of the big things we're trying uh, to avoid because that's where you start to get into some particular uh, issues with that too. So most of the data is already captured on an officer. That experience data is available to us uh, through our relationships with the agencies. But then also the other data, the, the aura ring data and you know other biometric data doesn't meet the HIPAA requirements. So we're able to get that in a much more easy fashion. Having said that, we also anonymize our data. So the whole point is that the officer feels safe and uh, able to use the system without fear that their department or others are gonna look at the data and begin to make decisions on their health and wellness data. So it's, it's a tool used for the officer or the firefighter or the first responder to be better to hopefully for the agency lower their, their costs in healthcare, improve the recruitment, uh, recruit, improve the retention, and also be competitive to be able to get the best officers. So you guys know that when I come on screen, it's a time check. <laughs> yeah, Luca, can I ask you to to uh, put across a, a very concise question and and uh, for Sean to give us a quick answer to that uh, so we can save the timetable? It is a disadvantage of being the last one to ask questions. Okay, uh, great presentation, Sean. I um, had a question regarding uh, the monetization. So I believe it's a $1 per first responder. Who who are your target customers? Uh, it's, it's a B2B, right? Rather than B2C? It's, it's inter interestingly, it's B2G. So it's B2G in the, in the fact that you sell to the agency. So you would mm -hmm. sell to the government agency and they would purchase it on behalf of their agency and all the officers would be the users of it. Having said that, we have a very strong B2B play because through partnerships is how we're going to grow and scale. 
That's how I was able to do it through my previous company. We had relationships with about 75 different companies, all of which serve public safety. These are all commercial businesses. And through our relationships and partnerships, we'll be able to deliver it to them. So it's a B2B play because we can white label it for those, uh, those commercial customers. And then we can also sell directly to the government entity. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. This was uh, really good again. Um, very inspiring. Thank you, Sean. And now I will ask the judges to move to the Google Meet, uh, where they will have a private session for uh, four minutes, please, uh, and to have a discussion amongst themselves as to who should be the winner. You have a uh, a Google Sheet, like an Excel spreadsheet, uh, as a scoring uh, mechanism for use that as a as a prop if you need to. You don't have to. Um, come back and I will ask uh, one of you judges to come back and announce the winner as soon as you're back. So please go ahead, dial into the Google Meet, make it quick, and I'll see you again in three to four minutes. Meanwhile, I have the privilege and uh, uh, and the uh, time to be able to um, ask all of the uh, um, contestants to switch on their webcams and uh, come online uh, so that we can all have um, just a quick uh, a quick chat while the judges are out uh, making their um, running through their deliberations. Um, uh, obviously, I'm really impressed with each and every one of your presentations. Uh, you're all absolute winners. And I'd love to stay in touch with all of you. Uh, I, I've got, you know, there's a lot that we can, uh, that, that, you know, I, that I can learn from you. And there's a lot that also our institute uh, that partners with uh, ITU can, can, can do for you in return in terms of helping you through your journey. Um, that said, I, I just wanted to ask you, um, and, you know, feel free to just jump in. And this is a question to the floor in general. Um, you know, what prompted you to want to participate and what do you hope to get out of, uh, uh, this uh, um, AI for good contest. And uh, at the same time, also, uh, you know, uh, what, what is your biggest challenge? Is it a funding challenge right now? Is it a, a visibility challenge? So if you would like to just jump in and um, uh, if, you, if you've got some comments to make, uh, this is a good time to do so. I'll jump in. <laughs> so uh -huh. what attracted me was the explosion in the frequency of autism. And the fact that outside of America, I'm sure a number of people are still being impacted by autism, but they're not getting access to care. And this gave us an opportunity on a global scale with the technology that can actually translate the telehealth session in real time. So that means that we can actually give care to people, say, who speak Mandarin and we're speaking English, and that child can still be diagnosed and have a recommendation for care based on our technology. That was exciting. Amazing. Anyone else? Uh, Taylor. Yeah, um, for us, one thing that we're really passionate about is uh, women all across the world don't often get to see technology leaders that um, look like me and some of the other leaders of our company. And so um, we just, you know, take every opportunity we can to share our story. There's so many partners, there's so many countries, there's so many people that could benefit from a technology like this. And so it's kind of dual fold. We're really excited just about the opportunity for people to hear our story, but also excited about the opportunity. I don't know if any of you all have daughters on the phone, um, but you know, if, if you point to your daughter and you say, hey, like here's somebody that's doing something, like you can create technology the world needs and loves. That's just deeply inspiring to myself and the other leaders of our company. Yeah, thanks for that, Taylor. Carlo, I can jump in. So what yeah. prompted us was our experience in clinical practice, uh, kind of seeing these patients coming in with infection, gangrene, sepsis, unfortunately undergoing lower extremity amputation, and looking at their scans, you know, five, 10 years back and recognizing that, hey, vascular disease was present, but nothing was really done about it. So we're looking to activate the imaging for the patient um, and, and kind of achieve the best outcomes. Uh, and we're so passionate about this as founders that uh, my co-founder and I, we have resigned from our private practice jobs here in Boston, uh, and we've taken a flexible community-based uh, job, which gives us more flexibility and time to kind of dedicate to the company uh, while maintaining our surgical skills. So uh, for this program, you know, increased visibility, uh, funding um, and and partnerships. I think those are the three things that we're really looking for. From from my side at Casper, 
I was working in robotics and AI area. And then notice when we talked to doctors who are on our advisory board that they have very episodic and transactional view of the patients. It's already too late. So we realized that by using these sensors, we can give them wealth of data. And, and some of our uh, advisors and, and investors are into dementia and sleep related issues, which are simply very difficult to diagnose or test for. So having that data in a nice to use platform, it got me into it. Other than my personal story related to my grandmother, but um, most people in healthcare startups have a personal story as well. That's great. Have, have uh, any of you had any interactions with the United Nations system um, until now? Maybe the medical folks with WHO or other agency? No? So, well... We'd uh, love you, to. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Uh, and uh, I think this is one of the greatest things about AI for good is that, uh, you know, you've got a, a very, very significant force for good that is putting this platform up. And so uh, I think just becoming part of this uh, organization and overall becoming part of this AI for good movement, being as present as possible will uh, um, open up so many incredible opportunities. Um, the last time I was there at the conference in Geneva last year, I was just absolutely mind blown by <clears throat> the level uh, that, that you talk, you know, you have everybody at the, you know, everybody who's at the top of their game in every field from medical to robotics to like every everything else the top top luminaries uh and uh yeah so it's definitely uh something that will uh give you a lot back um in terms of challenges uh I, 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 some of you i think are looking for funding but uh are, are there any other specific challenges that you're seeing right now in terms of accomplishing uh your dreams for us the funding is is essential um because the government sales cycle is quite long, as you can imagine. It's uh, easily six months, if not a year. So uh, to have funding to get us uh, you know, the necessary AI development and to have the ramp uh, to be able to you know, use that while we uh, enter the market is gonna be very helpful. And I'll just comment on what Taylor said about having a, a female tech um, mentor or somebody of a stature, my daughters and uh, you know, looking for tech, uh, looking for tech mentorship, and and always looking for people to aspire to and see that they can do that. And and so I appreciate you saying that. So that's uh, that's another person to look to for you. Yeah. Well, this is uh, uh, absolutely outstanding. Um, we we're uh, coming close to the wrap up, and I see that the judges have come back from their deliberation. Having been a judge myself for so many occasions, I know how, what an impossible decision. Uh, we put you into an impossible situation, and I uh, I uh, apologize for that. But at the same time, the quality of these contestants today is just uh, um, you know unfathomable. Uh, grateful for you, um, you know, having taken the time to make that decision and having stuck to the timetable. Um, could I have a volunteer from the judging panel to actually announce who's going to be the winner of this uh, 2024 AI for Good North America round? I'll kick us off and then every anyone can jump in um, who wants. I think I would um, say for all of us, like, thank you for all the work you're doing for good for the world. Like, that's, I think, the most meaningful thing that you get out of listening to all of these is brilliant people working on brilliant problems that make a difference for a large number of people. And so thank you for your, your work inside of that. Um, and I think that's what makes the discussion so tough is because there's so many um, great things that are happening that are making a difference. Um, I think as we looked at our um, the objectives and every all of the, the points in this space, um, we're super excited to announce that the winner of this round and this event was Stimuli. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> and cheers. Like, I feel like we should be like music, clapping, yeah. something. Um you know, we're, we know that all of these problems are big problems and in particular, the opportunity for this work to have global impact um, in rapid fashion and help us with our education of societies and reaching populations that need it because education is so critical. And um, we really loved the application of AI for good in that space. A start, uh, brilliant. Thank you very much, Sydney, uh, for uh, coming across and giving us uh, this information. Congratulations. To the winner, uh, this is very, very well-deserved, very inspirational work. Uh, wish you all the best success. And also congratulations to the other contestants. Stay in touch with me as well, uh, because I would like to do my best to help each and every one of you on your ongoing journey. 
And at this point, I will pass uh, it on uh, for closing remarks to Guillermo um, Martinez Rora. So thanks a lot, uh, Carlo, and a big thanks to our finalists and judges, as well as all the participants today. For the finalists today, uh, we'll keep in touch, as Carlo was saying, and have another closed session to hear more about your business plan in detail and help you explore further business opportunities. And we also encourage you to check out the AI for Good program online to see more sessions that may be of interest to you. And especially, we are very much looking forward to welcoming you all for the upcoming special in-person AI for Good Innovation Factory Grand Finale here in Geneva on the 30th of May uh, next month. Uh, so stay tuned with us. And I really hope to see you next uh, month in Geneva. So have a lovely day or afternoon or evening uh, for some of you in the nighttime. Uh, and thanks a lot. And see you here next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for Good. The AI for Good Global Summit, convened by ITU, recognizes the joint responsibility of governments, the private sector, United Nations agencies, academia and others, to ensure AI reaches its full potential while preventing and mitigating harms. And it's a moment that calls for action. And today I'm calling on each of you, each of you to use this summit to help the world to better understand what kinds of regulations, what kinds of guardrails we need to put in place right now. So together, let's make it innovative, let's make it safe, and let's make it responsible for all. Thank you very much. Thank you.